Rutgers, welcome. We welcome you this evening in the name of the Lord. Uh, on the airwaves of Norwalk and the cables of, of the world. It's just like we're, uh, we're worldwide, amen? Isn't that right, Jordan? Worldwide, all right. So we're gonna give you a minute, we're always, we try to start a, a minute earlier or so. We're still obviously working out all of the bugs that uh, we have with our system. So uh, anyway, we do thank you for your patience and thanks for tuning in despite some of our technical snafus. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get all this all the way through this evening, right Jordan? If not, we're trying to record it as well so that if we do die, um, you know, not the physical death and not the spiritual death, but you know what I'm saying, if we, if we die the Facebook death, then we'll try to uh, put it on uh, Facebook uh, after we're done here. But anyway, if you have your Bibles, turn the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. The book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verse 12. We're going to continue the thought in Christianity 101. And so, uh, you know, keep going with that. Every time I think I'm just about done and we're going to move on a little bit, the Lord really speaks to me. Driving down here yesterday, what is today, Wednesday? Yeah, it must be Wednesday. I'm at church, right? Amen. A little tired today. Um, you know, the Lord was really putting it on me. There's two specific messages that are just really, really, uh, I just couldn't shake. And so this is one of them. And then uh, maybe Sunday we'll do the other one and we'll just kind of add that to our unnamed series. Amen. So if you're there in the book of First Corinthians in chapter 6 and verse 12, then say amen. If you're not, read it behind me. Amen. So notice that the Bible says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to come to your house, and uh, Lord, to uh, hear your word, Lord, to hear it on Facebook, and uh, Lord, maybe assemble as a family and, and open your word on this Wednesday night. And Lord, I just pray a special blessing for those that are making the the effort and the, the attempt. Uh, Lord, uh, you know their needs even more than they do. And Lord, I just pray that you would hear from heaven and that you would help to meet their needs. And Lord, I just pray now as we go through this uh, lesson, this message, this whatever, uh, Lord, I, I just pray that you would just speak to our hearts and minds. And Lord, that you would help to strengthen us in our faith. Lord, you would help us to grow up to be the Christians you would have us to be. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Port Wainimi, Little League was king. And I, I mean, Little League was, was the way to go. And it was tough. I mean, it was like, uh, I mean, people were, it was cutthroat, you know. And uh, it, it was interesting because we had a, we had a coach that always, um, we played by the rules, but as far as I know, uh, but there was these, this, these gray areas, you know. And, and uh, I don't know if it was legal or not legal, but the, by the stir that it created, uh, you know, makes you wonder. I played first base, and the, and the pitcher would call me over, and while we're huddled up and we're, we're talking, um, he would give me the ball, kind of hide it and give me the ball. And, and so I would take the ball back to first base, and then as soon as he'd like pretend like he was going through his windup, and he would never touch the, he'd never touch the rubber because that would be a balk. And uh, he would pretend like he's going through his windup, and of course the kid would jump off first to take a lead, and I'd tag him out, right? I remember the first time we did that, I mean, everybody went nuts, right? Uh, I mean, they went nuts. It was an uproar like you don't know. And, uh, but you know what? As far as, as far as we know, and to this day, as far as I know, there was no written rule against it. But let's be honest, it did violate the spirit of, of fair play, the rule of fair play, and, uh, or the principles of, of, of fair play, amen? And so, you know, I was thinking about a lot of Christians wish that the Bible contained really specific rules for every situation, uh, governing, governing every possible thing that would face in their lives. And, and, you know, there's a lot of things in the Bible. And, you know, most people, I remember years ago, people would say, you know, what's the line and what can I get away with? How far is too far? Um, you know, what can I do? What can I can do? But uh, the problem is, when we, when we think that way, really, um, you can't write a book 
uh, it would be so thick and it would be so big and it would be so huge uh, what to do in every situation uh, that no one would read it, amen? Nobody would study it. Uh, nobody would uh, obey it, right? People would still be in the dark. Uh, but you know what? God has given us his holy word, the Bible, uh, and it contains all the principles uh, that we need to be able to live for him in this world. And so in this verse and uh, on through chapter 10, Paul lays out several very important principles uh, for the Corinthian believers. Remember, that's where we started with this, this study and that uh, there were babes in Christ and uh, Paul had heard some things that the Corinthian church weren't going right. Uh, he knew he had to address some things uh, because being a Christian, while there's freedom, uh, it's, not a, it's not freedom for licentiousness. It's not freedom uh, in the sense that it's anarchy, like what we're seeing in the streets today, but it's freedom from the bondage of sin. It's freedom from the taskmaster. It's freedom from all of that other stuff. And so, uh, you know, he's, he's very... Uh, quick to give them the information that they need uh, while addressing the problems that they have. And so Paul's writing here to these very immature Christians. Uh, some are, again, true babes in Christ, if you remember a few weeks back. And, and, and so he reminds them, like, little children, you know, they think there's a root rule for everything. Little kids, you know, you watch the little kids at play, and it's crazy, because before long, somebody yells, that's not fair. That's not fair. Um, you know, uh, by the way, kids need rules, amen, and ki kids love rules, and, you know, if you watch them not play long enough, you're going to see that they even try to change the rules or make up rules that will work it to their advantage, to their strengths, or, or, or for their weaknesses, but, you know, it's interesting because as we think about rules, and we think about law, and we think about legality, and, and we think about all that other stuff, you know, as parents, our rules, right, uh, as our children grow up, we lay all kinds of rules out for them to, to go by. And, uh, but then all of a sudden, one day you look back and they're all grown up and, and they're, they're out on their own. And now you can't tell them all the rules. You can't tell them what to do and what not to do and, and all of those other things. By then, by the time they move out, they should have established in their lives some principles uh, by which they can, can live their lives and be successful. And so... You know, if we teach them the precepts and we teach them the principles, then uh, they will know how to respond in any situation, not just specific situations. Amen. And so today I want to share with you some uh, precepts, if you will, some precepts. I, I'm going to call it precepts for practice. And it's funny because I do remember Brother Riddle had a ton of books and uh, one of the booklet titles was Precepts for Practice. And, and I searched the internet to try to find out who wrote it. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I searched the internet to see if I could, you know, get a copy of it, read something about it, uh, who the publisher was. I couldn't find it. And so if you do Google precepts in practice, it's not the Buddhist version. Amen? Because there's a Buddhist version, uh, the precepts in practice. Uh, and so I don't want you to think that I'm up here preaching Buddhism. Amen, Jordan? We're not doing it. All right. So these precepts, though, that we're going to go through uh, in Christianity 101 will definitely help out all of the young Christians, all the babes in Christ, all the carnal Christians. It'll help every Christian. If we get down and we nail down uh, these things in our lives, then uh, we'll, we'll definitely be ahead of the curve and we'll be able to make right decisions. Because, you know, as we grow in Christ, we need to be liberated from the legalism of rules. Amen. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the most important things is that we don't live by a set of rules. We le live by a separated heart. Like, we're not rule keepers. We're Lord lovers. Amen? And that's what should drive our conduct. That's what should drive our, <coughs> excuse me, our choices. <coughs> so, as we go on, if we learn to apply these principles to life, uh, that we might know how to live without someone having to tell us every move to make. Um, and we could start making those decisions wisely. And, and that's a mark of maturity, amen? That's, that's where we're supposed to be. And so these are rules. These are lessons that every Christian would do well to learn and to use, amen? So let's get started. I've got six points tonight. 
But I can honestly tell you that we're not going to get through all six. Amen. We might go through two. Uh, we'll see how the clock goes. But I'm really trying to, and when we're online like this, I'm going to really start trying to get down to 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, we'll get back on track with that. But as, as we start, I'm going to ask the first question. Somebody says, hey, Brother Taylor, can I do this as a Christian? Uh, is this legal? Is this lawful? Can I, can I make this happen? Well, the Apostle Paul actually deals with it, and we'll ask the question, is it expedient? Because Paul says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Amen? All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Jordan, can you turn down number one just a little bit? Because I'm hearing some weird, or is that you on the phone? I'm hearing some feedback. And uh, so notice all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So this is a compound principle, right? There are two questions raised here that can help you decide whether something is right or wrong. And the Apostle Paul deals with it that way. All right. First of all, is it lawful? Is it lawful? Is there any word from God concerning what I want to do, right? Because when God speaks of an issue, it's settled, amen? Somebody type in amen if you're watching, right? But that's the truth. Is it lawful? Because if God says it's not lawful, then we can't do it anyway, and that sets the stage. But, when, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so, you know what? There's some very clear absolutes in the Scripture, amen? Um, I would say the Ten Commandments, Right? would be very, very clear, absolutes. Uh, it's no, there's no relativism, but it's absolute. Can you kill somebody? It's against the law, amen? It's against the law, so don't kill anybody. That kind of nails it for us, right? Uh, last Sunday, I think I talked about robbing a bank. I'm not, I'm not advocating murder. I'm just saying that, you know, there are some things that we know, absolutely know, that we don't do, that Christians don't do. We don't break the law. But then the question isn't, is it legal? The question is, is it expedient? Is it expedient? And the, the Greek word translated expedient means literally to bear or bring together, right? With a personal reference to be well or profitable, right? So right is right. Wrong is wrong. Murder, wrong. Amen. Uh, we have laws in our country based on the Ten Commandments. If it violates the law, it's wrong. But expedient means, does it bring us towards a destination that we want to go? So if it's unlawful, don't do it. Is it expedient? Will it bring us to that place that we want to be? And so every decision or activity either moves us towards Jesus or away from Jesus, amen? And so the question is, does this thing that I want to do, does this thing that I want to engage in, does this, you know, whatever it is, is this going to bring me closer to the Lord or is it going to take me further away from the Lord? And if it doesn't take you closer to the Lord, then it's wrong, amen? Because it doesn't take us, it doesn't get us to where we need to be. As children of God, we should be focused on being more Christ-like, and, and we should be focused on living our life that is pleasing to the Lord. Because, you know, I can do anything I please, right? I can do anything I want. Uh, you know, we, we preached a while back on motivation, choice, right? You can do whatever you want. You've got the choice to do whatever you want. You've got that freedom. You can do it. But you also have the responsibility, Amen. So I can do anything I please, however, not everything I can do will help me grow as a Christian. And if it doesn't bring me closer to my destination, it's wrong. And it doesn't matter what it is. So as we look to these precepts, right, as we look to these precepts, that's, that's where we got to start is... Is this going to enhance my relationship with the Lord? Do I want to do, is it going to increase my relationship with the Lord? Is it going to draw me closer to the Lord or not? So, you know, God's plan is, and I think God's plan for every Christian is, 
in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen? And so that's why he gave apostles. If you, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, and before you get to that verse, that's why he gave apostles. That's why he gave prophets. That's why he gave evangelists, pastors, and teachers, is so that we as Christians would be able to, to get closer to the Lord, come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. And that's God's plan for our lives, is that as we go through this journey uh, called life, whether it's five days or five years or a hundred years, every day that we're alive, we should be getting closer and closer and closer to Jesus. Amen? And so the question then is, what you want to do, what you're being tempted to do, what you have a question about, the first thing that you have to answer for yourself is, is it expedient? Not if it's lawful, but is it expedient? And then the next one I think is very interesting too because remember he said all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So the next question is, will it enslave you? Right? It, will it enslave you? And, and really what we're talking about, to be brought under power, means just that, to be enslaved. And, you know, we were all slaves to sin at one time, amen? Uh, there's still people that are out there that are still slaves to sin, but if you not name the name of Christ, if you're a Christian this evening, that was your old life, that was your old man, you were a slave to sin, right? But we've been delivered, amen? We've been delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ and, and we're, we're no longer to live in that state. We're no longer to, be, uh, to, to live under that, uh, the, being the taskmaster, if you will, of sin. Amen? Anything outside Jesus that controls my life, right? Anything outside of Jesus that controls my life is sin, right? Because there's only two forces in the world. There's only two forces in operation in the whole world, right? You got good and you got evil. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. You're either for God or against God. Amen? There's no middle ground. There's no like, you know, I was in. I'm, I'm kind of cool. You know, it's all good. And, uh, you know, I'm not really wanting to take a side on this. Jesus said, listen, you got two sides. Either you're with me or you're against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That's what Jesus said, right? Now, it's interesting because unsaved people think they're in control. They think they're in control. But they're not, right? They're not. Like I said earlier, they're free to choose their actions. We got freedom of choice, but you don't get the right to choose the consequences of those actions. Amen? I mean, I think that's where we get it mixed up sometimes. I think that's where, you know, people really miss the mark is because they think, you know, I have the right to choose and all that. Great, you do have the right to choose. You also have uh, the right or the law, I guess it'd be a natural law, that you will feel the consequences of your actions, right? And so, you know, we need to search our lives. Basically what I'm saying is, you know, we need to search our lives and be sure that no habit, no attitude, no activity, no pursuit, no matter what it is, has us enslaved. Amen? Uh, we can't be enslaved. And so, uh, notice, uh, you know, as we, as we look back, is it expedient? Right? Uh, will it enslave you? And then, the next one is, I think, equally as important, because um, this is where I, I don't think we, we put enough emphasis. Because, here's the thing. 1 Corinthians in chapter 8, right? 1 Corinthians in chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 8 through 13, right? But meat condemneth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Basically, he's saying it doesn't matter if you eat, right? 
But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man uh, see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And, and, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Now I'm going to stop here for a minute because you know one of the things that really irritated me years ago is this whole weaker brother conversation, you know, and say, oh, who's the weaker brother, the legalist or the, or, or the liberal or whatever, you know, and it was just ridiculous. It was just absolutely mind-numbing, and, and the question, or the answer is this. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I won't eat meat. I will no, eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Amen? Let's go back and, and, and consider something here. Corinth, where Paul lived, we got to remember, was a pagan society. Amen? Many who lived there practiced idol worship. Uh, they would sacrifice a sheep or a goat to God, and, and then they would sell the meat to the butcher uh, at the meat market, right? And, and then the butcher, in turn, would make the meat available to the public, and he'd discount the price. Uh, it's perfectly good meat, um, and the price is right. So... I'm just saying, you know, daddy likes a good deal on a steak. You know what I'm saying? I think what's going on right now, and I can't find a good steak, and they jumped up ribeyes, $3 a pound, Jordan, $3 a pound. I'm sure there's people going to hell over that. I'm just sure there is. But I like a good deal. And obviously, the Christians in those days liked a good deal, right? And so the Christians would say, hey, listen, you know what? Don't tell me where it's coming from. It's a good deal. Let me, let me, you know, let's, let's talk about it, right? But other people started looking, and they're like, wait a minute, you can't eat that. That's, that's been sacrificed to idols, and, and that's been offered to devils. And what happened was, is these opposing camps began to argue, argue uh, real bitterly about this issue, and they, they turned to Paul for help. And he thought the inspiration of the Lord, and, 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 but through the inspiration of the Lord, he gave us this precept of example. You know, I want to make it clear, Paul doesn't give him an ironclad rule. Matter of fact, he doesn't say yes or no, does he? He doesn't say, yes, you can eat it, and the rest of you just need to deal with it. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, no, that's been offered up to devils, and there's no way, and if you eat it, you're going to defile your body, and you're just going to go to hell. He doesn't do that. I mean, it's almost perfect, the way he answers it. And it's the way that we need to look at the things that we want to do. Amen? He didn't give him an ironclad rule. He said that the meat would not make you better or worse. Isn't that what it says? It's not going to make you better or worse. It's not going to make you a better Christian if you abstain. It's not going to make you a worse Christian if you, if you eat it. The meat itself doesn't have any... What, who cares? It's just meat. I mean, honestly, let's be honest. I mean, the butcher could just start lying if the Christians stopped buying this meat. They'd just start lying and say, oh, no, no, it was, you know, we, it was a roadkill. We just killed, you know. That's why the price is, no. Jordan doesn't like roadkill. But, you know, he doesn't give them... He says, he says instead, he doesn't say... Yes, he doesn't say no. He doesn't say get, He said it's not going to make you any better. He said it's not going to make you any worse. But he says this, don't do anything. Don't do anything. It would make you a stumbling block to another believer. You know, we live in a society today that is pretty broad, pretty open, you know, and the last thing that we need as Christians is to be putting ourselves in a place and getting involved with things that are going to shed a damaging light on the Lord. Amen. Because all things are lawful, not all things are expedient. Right? And, you know, where, where's my testimony in this? Right? Am I going to be enslaved? And then where's my testimony in this? Right? Because the one thing that will make anything wrong 
is if you cause your brother to stumble. See, the issue isn't, will it hurt me? That's not the issue. The issue isn't, will it hurt me, right? The issue is, and the question is, could it hurt my brother, amen? Could it hurt my brother? Why? You say, well, what does that matter? Well, because other people are supposed to come first if we're Christians, amen? Other people are supposed to come first. In, in, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, and, and, and I'm going to close with this verse, or, or this, this little piece right here, and we'll pick it up the next time, but I, I want to make this point because we're supposed to con be consider one another. We're supposed to worry about others. Amen? Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2. It's a beautiful verse. You guys probably all got it memorized. You guys probably are very deep in this verse, right? This is a great verse. It'll help you a lot. Amen, Jordan? I don't know. I can't see you. These lights are so bright. But anyway, let's do this. I beseech Eudeus and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. That's deep and profound, amen? That's deep and profound. So it's a simple verse and we blow by it, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Well, two women connected with the church were at odds, at enmity, pretty much at war, all right? at war with each other, right? And they were both respected women. They were both involved in the Christian work. They were both active in doing things, but you know what? For some reason, somehow they differed. Now, the cause of the quarrel, I don't know what it is. I really don't know what it is, right? And I, st I, I looked all over the world to try to find out what it was because that would make it so much easier. But we're talking about precepts, right? And, and there's, there's a couple of things that some of these writers and commentators say is, number one, it could be, they were divided over some kind of doctrine, some form of doctrine. Others say they just had a difference of opinion, and they let it fester. And then that right there is what got them worked up and, and going. And others said it might have just been a careless word that one just said something without considering how the other one might take it, and that started it off. It's like, uh, what, what's the hillbillies, the, uh, uh, the Hatfields and McCoys, right? Maybe that's what it was. The Yodiuses and the Syntikes, right? I don't know. I don't even know if I said that right, but notice Paul said, I beseech them that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, I want you to, I want you to understand what he's saying. I want you, I want you, I beseech you that you be in the same mind. You understand? I beseech you, I beseech you that you're in the right mind. You guys got to come together in the right mind, amen? You got to let this stuff go. There's some petty stuff happening right here. You're both fellow workers. You're both Christians. You're both serving the Lord. You're both doing something. You're both saved. Listen, so you have a disagreement. It could be doctrine, right? Amen? It could be a, a, a difference of opinion on if Jesus or if uh, Adam had a belly button, right? It could have been, he said something bad about me, and, uh, and, and now, you know, uh, we're at war. Listen, each side thought they were right. Each side, each side, each one of these women thought they were right, and they possessed a greater insight into the issue, but... I want to read something to you. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Jordan, can we get that up there? All right. Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Amen? 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4 and verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Philippians chapter 4 
verses 3 through 9, goes with Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, by the way. Notice what it says, And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. The Apostle Paul says they're Christians, their names are in the book of life. Amen? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now here's our problem. I think this is exactly what Paul was trying to get to with these women. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. You know, if those of us that name the name of Christ would actually understand the Bible and follow its precepts, imagine what could be done for the kingdom of Christ. Amen? I mean, honestly, imagine. If when we had differences of opinion, we followed these verses, instead of judging and, and taking sides and dividing, if we would follow Paul's instructions and whatever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, listen, I'm not going to think about all the bad things about you. I'm going to think about all the good things about you. I'm going to think about all the positive stuff about you. I'm going to focus on what you did right, not necessarily what you did wrong. I'm going to focus and give you the benefit of the doubt because we're fellow laborers in Jesus, and, and we're both saved, and we're both going to heaven, and it's time that we get off of our own little petty things, and we come together, amen? You know what, if we would ever do that, Jordan, revival would break out. I think one of the biggest things, honestly, that's holding the, the modern-day church back from seeing a real hand of God, the modern-day free will Baptist from seeing a real move of God, is because of all the silly and stupid division over the petty, stupid things. Instead of focusing on the big things and the important things and the, and, and the, 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 you know, the good things and the just things and the, the righteous things, and, and, and with, instead of thinking about, hey, maybe he didn't mean to say it that way, or, 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 or maybe I should just start really thinking that it's not, you know, that person is not as bad, so that we can have brotherly love, and we could be a united front against the devil who's trying to tear us apart? Man. You know? I, I, I'm going to stop right here because, you know, the, the Lord's really been on, on me with this lately. It's so easy, it's so easy, so easy to think the negative. Amen? I, I'll be honest with you. Let's, let's, let's do a little honesty, right? A little vulnerability. You know, as a pastor during this COVID crisis, not being able to see people or talk to people or, or you know, fellowship or, or do anything like that, right, in real life, you know, you're, you're waiting for a phone call. You're hoping for the best. You're, you know, you're, you're trying to do things and all of that. But, you know, it's funny how the devil will start putting seeds of doubt in your mind and, you know, somebody will say something the wrong way or somebody and, and then... You know, it's like that you start, he just starts watering it with all of his vinegar and, and bile. And then pretty soon, you know, you, you just start thinking, it's easy. And if a pastor can do that, if a pastor can go negative like that, why couldn't anybody else? You know, we need to start really focusing on the, the real stuff. Letting our prayers and our supplications with thanksgiving, all of our requests be made known unto God and, and let the, the, the peace of God pass through us and, and decide that whatever things are honest and whatsoever things are just and whatsoever things are pure and whatsoever things are lovely, 
and whatsoever things are of good report, and if there's any virtue, and if there's any praise, those are the things we need to be thinking about. Not that so-and-so did such-and-such and is a so-and-so, but you know what? So-and-so might be going through a hard time right now, and so-and-so might be lashing out, but you know what? They got good qualities. You know what? And they're trying. And instead of condemning them and fighting them and, and, and all of that, you know what? And being at war with them and enmity with them, maybe I should just come alongside of them and, and kind of grab their elbow and, and help them. And let brotherly love continue. Our Father, we thank you for this evening. And Lord, I, I just pray as the, the message goes out, again, that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, we, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Lord, I just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would help us to see that. And Lord, when we see somebody that might not be living to our standards, or we see somebody that might look like they're failing or falling, Lord, I, I just pray that instead of judgment, we would, we would offer support and kindness and grace and mercy. Lord, when somebody says something to us, Lord, and I, I pray that you would give us the strength and the, and the presence of mind to, to, to give them the benefit of the doubt. Lord, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. Lord, these are precepts for our practice. And Lord, we've we got to get some of these things down in our lives. And Lord, I just pray that you'd send the Holy Spirit to speak to us again. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you the praise and the glory for it all. And we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name.